Hello, this is Bryant Myers, author of PEMF, The Fifth Element of Health. I've taken a couple of years off, but I'm back in PMF now, and I'm really excited to share with you this 2023 Buyer's Guide of PMF Devices. And I want to give you 15 different tips on what to look for when shopping for a PMF device because I have seen PMF therapy help so many people over the years. So I want to make sure you have the best information to find a good unit if you're in the market for one. And perhaps you have one, and I mean, I'll give you some good information that you can certainly apply to whatever unit you might have right now. But the, one of the reasons I'm coming back in is there's a lot of these cheap Chinese Alibaba products that are flooding the market. And so I'm going to do some videos on that specifically. But that was one of the motivations for me to do this buyer's guide so that you, you really know what to look for when looking for a good PMF device. And so... Let's get right into it now. There's basically five categories of PMF. You have your full body mat devices, you have your high intensity, your portable, and then you have like your, uh, the, the big coil devices like amp coil, halo, and dug coil. And I'm not gonna talk too much about those, but we're gonna mainly focus on what I feel is the best type of PMF, which is a full body mat device. And there is some that are more affordable and there's some that are a little more expensive, but you typically want ones that are going to be a lower intensity using lower frequency repetition rates with a broad spectral content. That's kind of just a preview of what we're going to talk about. And But first, I want to get into the coils of the system first. I want to start with, you have a good full body mat PMF system, and the coils are incredibly important because a round circular coil, you're getting a pure magnetic field to the center of the coil. It's very important that you have a tightly wound perfectly circular coil and you want to make sure that it's large enough to give you enough magnetic flux, which we'll talk about in a minute. And um, you want to make sure you have ideally a full body mat with multiple coils to cover the full body because you want to be have your whole body immersed in this PMF energy. And, and then it's good to have local applicators like pillow type of pads, uh, little pads you can put in your chair, uh, like a probe or pen type of applicator, Helmholtz coils. These you follow up your full body mat session with to work on those targeted areas. So some examples of, of, of good coils, I would say, are the IMRS, uh, the Omnium, the Beamer, uh, Centropics has good coils, Vasindux has good coils, Curatron, Parmeds has good coils. Um, some examples of poor coils, I don't particularly like the QRS Metathera coils. They use a big round race track in the middle of their full body mat. And the, and, the, and the windings are spaced out, so the field lines are going to kind of bleed out, which you can see in the formulas for, for inductance when you really look at why you want a tightly wound circular coil. There's scientific reasons for that. And, so, and then the other problem is, is it's a whole big coil, so you get a big bump of energy in the middle of your body. And that's not ideal. This is why you want maybe six or eight coils spread through a full body mat to kind of give you an even distribution. But you don't want them too small, like BioBalance and OMI, their coils are just too small. You want, it's kind of a happy medium where you got uh, six or eight large coils that cover the full body mat. Now, the next thing is intensity. And this I call the biggest lie in PMF because there are some well-known PMF experts that say you need a higher intensity. In fact, there's some uh, really actually very good books on PMF by this particular expert that do have good, they have really good information on the research behind PMF, but the chapters where he talks about the intensity and the science is just wrong. And I'm, I'm going to do a whole video on this. I don't want to bring this up too much right now, but the bottom line is he's recommending high intensity based on an inverse square law. Now, the Biosavart law, which is what you use to calculate magnetic field intensity, is actually, for coils, it ends up being a 1 over 3 halves law. Now, point sources do have a 1 over R squared, but a large coil, it drops off much more slowly. And just to give you an idea how wrong he is with his numbers, he's got some charts in these books, which I'm putting on the screen here for you to see. And I, I'm going to do a whole video on this, but let's just take the 5 inches away. For the IMRS coil... It turns out that when he says it's only 0.5% in this chart, actually when you do the math for, a, for an 11 centimeter radius coil, it ends up being uh, still 25% of the source, which means he's off by 5,000%. He, 
So he is misleading people saying that you need high intensity because low intensity doesn't penetrate enough, but he's using the wrong equation to justify that. And, and he's been pointed out this, not just by myself, but other people. So he knows better. And at this point, I think he's just deceiving people. And, and it's just kind of, it's sad because if you're going to recommend high intensity, okay, but don't do so using bad science and the wrong equation. So that's all I want to say about that. I don't want to keep this too negative, but I have to bring this up because so many people are getting misled by this particular expert and a few others that because of this inverse square law, you need high intensity, but that is the wrong equation. Again, I'll, I'll put a link below my video. I have a whole page where I've done kind of an errata on this section of his book, which he pretty much just duplicates in this book. Um, so again, basically magnetic field intensity you calculate from the bios of art law, but but here's the thing, as we're going to find out here in a minute, intensity is not even the most important thing. I would say it's not even the second or third most important thing. So all this hype about intensity, and as you're going to see, I'm going to give you a very vivid understanding of this, that intensity is absolutely not the most important thing you want to look for. But it is important. So you do need enough intensity. So I tell people it's sort of like listening to classical music. You know, the PMF signal is kind of the music of a PMF system. So when you're relaxed and you're listening to classical music, you want just the right volume. Similarly, with a PMF device, you want just the right intensity so your cells can hear the signal. And it turns out that you can do demonstrations, which I've done, with like a MicMeg Handy or a Tri-Field Meter. And I can show people with a demonstration that when someone's laying on the IRS or the Beamer or any low-intensity system, you can still measure the field a couple feet above them. Now, this would be impossible if, if this particular expert's equation was right, which it's not, and his charts were right, which they're not, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to measure it a couple feet up. So that, that's important to bring up because you can verify for yourself that these low-intensity systems have plenty of intensity. And again, we're going to see the key is the rapid rise and fall, not the intensity. So let's get into the PMF signal here. So the signal is really the main thing, along with the coils. The coils are like your speakers or your antenna on a PMF system, so they're important. But the main thing, the music, is the signal. The signal is the heartbeat of a PMF system. It's its lifeblood. It's the secret sauce, you could say, that makes a PMF device either work or not work. And there's basically four components, Faraday's law of induction, which we're going to look at, resonance, the repetition rate, and the variation. So. Let's start with Faraday's law because this is one of the keys to whether a PMF system works. And, and you're going to see this is more important than intensity. So what Faraday's law says is that whenever you have a, a changing magnetic field, you induce an electric field that will then increase the voltage and drive uh, charges or currents in the body. And these healing microcurrents help to stimulate stem cells help to stimulate healing and regeneration. And this is why microcurrent therapy devices work. But very interestingly, uh, I just want to give you this little story about how, basically how PMF really became popular back in the 70s and, and 80s, or how it sort of took off, is uh, Robert Becker did these salamander studies, and he, he would amputate the limb of the salamander. And of course, we all know that the salamander limbs grow back. He would do the same thing on a frog, which is ge genetically similar to a salamander, right? But the frog's limb didn't grow back. And what Robert Becker figured out was that the voltage potential, the energy at the stump, there was a higher voltage swing on the salamander, almost like having live wires. Like there was just this, all this energy coming out. And this energy or these currents that the body of the salamander was producing would stimulate the regeneration of the limb. The frog did not have such of a voltage swing. So the, there wasn't like those live wires, that energy, which is sort of, it was more like a capped off wire where it was just nothing was there to drive that uh, regeneration. But what Robert Becker found was by adding microcurrent to the frog, this is just amazing, he was able to regenerate the limbs of the frog. So this amazing discovery, he realized that, wow, and so he kind of applied this understanding to bone fractures. And he would surgically, or he would work with electrodes on both sides of a fracture, and he was getting results, but it was very invasive. So it took Arthur Pilla and Andrew Bassett, 
they were actually going to see it to a conference, an orthopedic conference where Robert Becker was speaking. And they kind of met fortuitous, fortuitously, I think, on a plane. And as the story goes, um, Arthur Pillow was kind of overlooking Andrew Bassett and what he was doing on the plane. And he kind of, they realized they were going to the same conference. And Arthur Pillow was basically telling Andrew Bassett, you know, the, what, what, you, what you do with electrodes like Robert Becker's doing, you can do with Faraday induction coils. Meaning, whether you use actual electrodes to increase voltage or a changing magnetic field to increase voltage, the net result is the same. This non-invasive ability to induce healing microcurrents without needing invasive surgical electrodes was, was a big breakthrough because, um, no, no pun intended, on the non-union fractures, and, and, and Andrew Bass was able to get FDA approval for his bone stimulation device. And again, it would just simply surround the fracture, and through Faraday induction, it would increase these microcurrents that caused healing and regeneration. Again, like in the frog. So healing is voltage. When you can increase cellular voltage or increase these tissue microcurrents, you're basically increasing the body's ability to heal and regenerate. And, and this is why PMF therapy is, I, I've seen so many hundreds of testimonials with pain relief, injuries, and recovery. It's because of this, mainly, really. So what do we want? So to, to duplicate what Andrew Bass is doing, we're basically trying to use Faraday induction, which is basically... The ch this is a minus sign, the change of flux over time. So flux is basically the, the intensity times the area of the coil. So a bigger coil has more flux. For example, the IMRS versus the OMI. I've done this demonstration before. IMRS is 11 centimeter uh, radius. OMI is only one centimeter. So the IMRS has 121 times more area. So for a given intensity, the IMRS will have 121 times more flux than the OMI. So you can see how intensity is not the key here, but it even goes further that it's how quickly you change this, this magnetic flux through the coil that determines the amount of induction, like Andrew Bassett, like creating this healing microcurrents. Uh, and so its intensity, yes, is part of it, but it's only one-fourth of it. The area of the coil and then the speed of induction, this is really the key. It's this rapid rise and fall. So it's like when you swipe a credit card, you swipe it quickly. That quick swipe is what induces the current that, that will register with the, the credit card reader. And the, the minus sign comes from Lenz's law. That's just the opposing, because you're basically adding energy to the coil, to the field. So that, that there's going to be a back, a back sort of voltage that kind of counteracts this, this creation of this field. And, and just to show you how important this is, this is actually how we want to measure, if you want to use intensity, it's, it's, the, it's the Faraday induction. This is what's more important than intensity. And the only way to measure this is with a good oscilloscope and a near field probe. So intensity is only one fourth of it. So forget about all these people using Gauss meters. It's just misleading. Uh, I can get a heating pad. I did a demonstration once where I took a heating pad and I got a strong magnetic field reading. I mean, so what? What you want to do is you want to see the signal with a near field probe and, and you're basically measuring the energy in the field because at the end of the day, your body is in, immersed in this magnetic field, right? This changing magnetic field. So it doesn't matter what the intensity is or what the currents are in the, in, in the, in the, if you, because you can probe the currents too with these devices. You want to know what's the what's the energy in the field and what does the waveform look like on an oscilloscope? Does it have a sharp rise and fall? And what is its speed of induction? So let me give you some examples of uh, good examples and bad examples. So a good example of of a rapid rise and fall is the IMRS square wave, and and I've looked at this in detail, and it's it gets to an incredibly sharp uh, uh, rise and fall, and that's going to really increase these healing microcurrents. Another good example is Robert Robert Dennis's uh, ISIS or Micropulse. Excellent. And he's he did work with NASA and Dr. Goodwin. So that original Goodwin study did show that a rapid rise and fall square wave at a very low intensity was very, very effective. And so it had tremendous benefits for healing and regeneration. And so he's got a really good signal that's a very sharp rise and fall. So again, the only way to know this for sure is to look on an oscilloscope and verify that the signal indeed has a sharp rise and fall. 
So another good example is uh, the QRS has a good triple sawtooth. The IMRS and Omnium triple sawtooth. Um, the the Beamer signal has a nice rise and fall towards the end, especially. Oh, Metathair is pretty good. Um, now the worst are the sine wave systems because they just have this gradual undulating rise and fall. You're not going to get much Faraday induction, especially with the lower frequencies, which is really what you want. So let's get down to the next thing here. And I'm just going to go over this briefly is polarity reversal. So the, the, the switching of polarity helps to prevent habituation or acclimation. So it's really good to have a PMF device that switches polarity. Usually, I mean, the good ones like um, the Beamer, the QRS, the IMRS, they do switch polarity. So that, that is important. So now I want to talk about the repetition rate frequency of a good PMF signal. Because complex signals, you can't just define them with a one frequency because you can only use frequency like that for a simple sine wave. When you have a bundles of pulses, or we, you could say pulses per second is kind of the repetition rate, um, so repetition rates, the frequency of non-sinusoidal signals where the periodic signal repeats itself. So again, you could have a square wave or a triple sawtooth and the number of times it repeats itself per second is the pulses per second or repetition rate. But it does get a little more complicated. For example, with the IMRS uh, square wave, what you have was, is a burst of five square wave uh, pulses that are pulsing at 17 hertz in this burst but then the bursts themselves are pulsing at two hertz or roughly, or 1.67 hertz. And this is, this is a common type of, this burst type of approach is used in actually some FDA approved um, signals as well. So very effective and it's, it's good because you're getting a lot of, you're getting variation and some added complexity, but also you're able to, um, you're able to sort of entrain the central nervous system because see, when the repetition rate is what the, the, the brain and the nervous system kind of hears, right? In fact, if I take my mic mic handy and make that signal audible, you hear the da, 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 da. Like with these signals, you can hear the pulses. But what you're hearing is the burst of pulses because our nerves and our nervous system can't really detect, you know, things much beyond 150 to 200 hertz because that's the, the action potential. It's about as quick as the nerves can recharge and fire, right? So there is a limit and, and it really helps to have repetition rates within these circadian rhythm ranges, meaning you want like a, a frequency of say 15 or 23 for beta in the morning. Uh, in the evening, you would want perhaps like around 10 Hertz for relaxation, which is alpha. And before bedtime, you're going to want like a lower frequency, maybe three Hertz, which is kind of a theta frequency, uh, before bed. And again, You'll, you'll basically pulse the repetition rates to match the circadian rhythm clocks. And I don't know why more PMF companies don't do this. It really, I, I don't get it. And some have repetition rates in their nighttime programs for sleep, like Centropics, which is, you know, I love the Centropics. It's great, but they don't have a well-defined signal. And I've noticed it doesn't really help for sleep at night. Not just me, but other people I've talked to that have used it. Where the IMRS, the first thing I noticed with the IMRS when I first used it, gosh, way back in 2007, was I noticed better, that first night, it blew me away. I got better sleep at a time I was having trouble sleeping. So this repetition rate is very biologically um, sort of active in the sense of it working to entrain with the central nervous system, but then it gets even better. So you want to have the right repetition rate, but you also want to have a rich spectral content because different, what um, this is this chart here, is from Energy Medicine, excellent book by James Oshman, where he summarized Siskin and Walker's original studies of different tissue resonances and cell resonances, and he added more current research. And what you find is that all the different tissues have different resonant frequencies, you know, from nerves and from uh, collagen, cartilage, bones, uh, ligaments, tendons. Um, so you have these different frequencies that have been research proven in literature to interact with different tissues. So ideally, it's like a multivitamin approach, right? If you, wouldn't you rather just take like one or two multivitamins a day and get everything you need? I mean, sometimes you gotta take four or five because you're getting so much. Versus taking vitamin C, vitamin B1, B2, B3, vitamin D, calcium, magnesium, iron, blah, you know, on and on and on, right? It's easier, so you wanna get this 
it's good to have this full spectrum approach because if you get a simple sine wave PMF system, you got to do this frequency for this, this frequency for that. This is why they have these big long list of protocols. That's a very inefficient way of doing it. And it comes from not having a good signal. Again, the signal is the key to a good PMF device. And a good signal has a rich spectral content, meaning on a spectrum analyzer, which decomposes the signal into all its frequencies, you see this broad band of frequencies that are in, that are in the signal. And it's kind of like um, the graphic equalizer on your, on your stereo. That's showing you the music in the frequency domain. The oscilloscope is showing you the, the, the wave in the time domain, what it looks like in space and time. So these are kind of like the two eyes you want to look at a good PMS signal with. Uh, with an oscilloscope, you can see the rise and fall. You can see what the shape of the signal is and the repetition rate. You can see that there too. And with the spectrum analyzer, you can see the, the, the frequency spectrum of the signal. And again, the broader the spectrum, the better. You typically don't want to go above a couple hundred thousand hertz. But the higher frequencies are needed for the sharp, sharp edges for the rise and fall. But they're typically in lower amplitudes. And, and interestingly, um, you can actually boost, like just like your uh, graphic equalizer, you can boost certain frequencies. So for example, in the, in the morning, you could boost, say, 25 to give you, so you can just kind of like raise that frequency band, right? It's kind of cool. I mean, the QRS kind of does this. IRS um, triple sawtooth will kind of do it this way as well. So this is really, really important because, again, if you don't have a rich spectral content, you're not really covering all your tissues, different tissue resonant frequencies. So here, more is better. More frequencies are better to really blanket this biologically active spectrum, especially between uh, 0 and 200 hertz, and really especially between 0 and 50. Most of them are all between 0 and 50, which I talk about in my book, is also the range of frequencies the brain operates, it's also the range of frequencies that the Schumann resonance is the Earth's magnetic field is pulsating at. So there's a deep connection in these low frequencies with our body and the Earth. And our bodies have kind of evolved with these natural energies. So when, we're, when we spend 93% of our time indoors or in cars, like the average American that comes from a census study, then we're not getting enough of this natural Earth energy by being indoors too much. So let's go through a couple last things here down the home stretch. So also important is pulse strain complexity or pulse pause modulation. And what that is, does is it just creates like layers of complexity where you have pulses within pulses within pulses. And the reason you do this is the same reason why you go to the gym. You don't just go to the gym and do like a thousand curls and leave, right? You're, you do one arm than the other, which is like switch and polarity, right? Then you do maybe five sets of this exercise and then five sets of the next exercise. And, and this gives you the overall, it's gonna challenge your body and give you the best results. So it's basically mainly to prevent habituation and acclimation, and also kind of from a hormesis effect, it's gonna to help to, to challenge your body so that it'll increase its natural defenses and compensatory networks that keeps the body healthy. Um, all right, so those are all, that kind of concludes everything about the, the coils and the signal, which are really the most important aspects of a PMF device. So it kind of leads to these two goals of PMF, just to kind of recap what I've just said. The first goal of PMF is to induce healing microcurrents in the body, organs, tissues, and cells through Faraday's law of induction using a rapid rise and fall signal. Again, intensity doesn't matter here. The key is how much voltage are you inducing on a, on an oscilloscope that gives you concretely how much voltage you'll induce in your tissues to create this regeneration we talked about the second goal of pmf is to use a signal with a rich spectral content with many different frequencies that fully blankets the biologically active range especially from zero to 50 but you know certainly it does go a little bit higher and other goals as we mentioned are switching polarities using a circadian rhythm or organ clock to give you the right frequency or repetition rate for the time of day, um, making sure you have large coils, and making sure your signal is complex enough to create to prevent habituation. So now let's talk about tip number nine, which is the accessories. Now there's good accessories and then there's some gimmicks that are just for marketing basically. Now the accessories that you definitely want are the local applicators. So like I said, you wanna do the full body mat first to get the microcirculation moving, 
to recharge cellular voltage. And this kind of warms the body up so that when you work on those local areas, you're going to get the, the best possible results. And so, like I said, a pillow pad, a probe or a pen, like a Helmholtz coil, or some of, they have some nice ones for chairs you can put over. Just any kind of localized treatment is very important. So you want a full body mat with local applicators. And sometimes it's nice to have brainwave entrainment at the same time. And you can either get a third party brainwave entrainment system or some systems like the IMRS QRS and a few others have integrated uh, light and sound systems. Uh, heart rate variability is something that the IMRS has, which is nice. So it will automatically adjust the intensity based on a heart rate variability biofeedback. So having biofeedback can be nice. Now, which, which gets right into the next point, which is or the buyer's tip, which is tip number 10, which is buy high quality. So you don't settle for cheap. Life is too precious. Your time is too valuable to settle for a cheap device like these uh, Chinese systems on Alibaba. And I definitely would tell people, just save up. You know, if you don't have the money now, just save up so you can get a good system. Now, there are some good affordable systems like the ISIS Micropulse, but it's a small local portable PMF. And those are inexpensive, but they're not cheap, meaning they're made of, they're very high quality. Robert Dennis's ISIS is very high quality. Um, but I still do recommend a full body mat device. You know, it's good to stick with a proven company or, you know, just do, just do some research. If you're thinking about buying from a certain PMF company, Make sure that that's a proven company, they have a good reputation, and you want to make sure it's got a good warranty with it so that you're covered. Um, number 12 or tip 12 is just FDA registration or different quality certificates and seals. You just want to make sure that it's essentially safe and that its electronic standards are, are, are at a high level so it's not going to break down. And so that's why these certificates are helpful because it assures that you're getting quality and safety. Um, does it work? Does it have pr a proven signal, proven research, and testimonials? And I've seen, to me, the devices that seem to get the most testimonials, the most profound results, are the lower intensity, like the IMRS Beamer, uh, QRS. And again, even uh, the, Centrop the newer Centropics is pretty good. And, you know, there's just a lot of good positive feedback because they have good signals, they have good coils, they're very well made, and they're safe. Um, the next point is, is it safe? So there's, I want to talk about two facets to this. The first is the intensity. So these high intensity devices that are either spark gap or the newer solid state are way, way off in the deep end on what's considered safe by international safety standards. Now the ICNRP or the International Commission of Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, if you read their reports, you're going to see that the highest level, this is at a very low frequency, of what's considered safe is at around 10,000 microtesla. Now, that's one one hundredth of a tesla, which means these systems that are at uh, a tesla to three teslas, which a lot of the higher intensities are going for, are a are hundred times outside of the range. So it's not even close. Now, granted, those these safety standards are for people that are in a continuous environment. And yes, High intensity PMF, you're not going to be using it all day long. You're not going to be around it all day long. However, I just think based on the important principles of induction and really good research, that high intensity is unnecessary. And of course, based on bad physics of that well-known expert uh, in his in his books, you know, he's justifying needing high intensity based on the wrong equation altogether. So that just makes you wonder. It's like, well, maybe we don't need high intensity. And the answer is you're right, you don't. And but besides, in a, well, let, let me just say this. Um, for clinics and doctors, because there does seem to be some good feedback in clinical settings with high intensity, you know, for pain relief and other issues, um, it, it can be used in that type of environment um, as long as the person isn't coming every day and not overdoing it. So the practitioner, you have to really work with your patients and uh, and if you're using the high intensity, start them off slow and then work it up very slowly. Just be careful. And But I absolutely do not recommend getting any of these high intensity systems for home use, everyday use. Absolutely not. Um, now, the other thing which um, we have to blame, basically it's QRS. And um, I, will, I won't name names to be respectful, but 
uh, QRS and PureWave. QRS and PureWave are the same mat. And they're touting a lot of this EMF protection, which, um, and I know this because the antenna engineer that I worked with and got a lot of good education from, he had a QRS and he dissected it and he saw the Fisher patent, which talks about electrosmog protection. And guess what? Even though it's in the patent, he couldn't find it anywhere in the device itself. So not only does it not have electrosmog protection, but funny, the QRS, they don't filter the AC at the wall or in the middle, like a lot of systems like IMRS Beamer, because um, you've got a pure DC signal coming in. They do it right inside their box. So you have the AC current from the power company coming into your QRS, and it's con yes, it's converted to DC in the, in the QRS control unit. Now, there was a video a long time ago, and I had to do rebuttal because QRS is using a lot of uh, very misleading marketing, trying to scare people. Don't buy this because it's got electrosmog. Only buy the QRS. It's the only one that's protected. Well, I've done several videos. I'll put some links below this video where I've tested the IMRS, Beamer, and QRS was fine, um, and a few other companies. And I used the same meter that they were using, and they all came out clean. So here's the bottom line. Don't believe, that's a gimmick. So if you put, and I say gimmicks and accessories, the whole electrosmog protection with QRS is a gimmick. Okay, they never even installed it in their system. And when you actually measure the electrosmog on all the low intensity systems, they're all clean. The only exception is the healthy wave, healthy line, higher dose, because they're just, they're just flat out running the 60 hertz right through the wires. But my experience is that now the high intensity systems now, that's another story. They're blasting on electrosmog, especially the spark gap ones, which is like 1920s technology, and they somehow make it... I mean, it's it's very crude, uh, and I think they're, they're changing slowly over to solid state, but there's still some out there that are using spark gap, and that's going to blast out a lot of electrosmog. And so the bottom line is, if you buy a low-frequency, low-intensity system, it's filtering the AC to DC at the wall or in a box, and you're just getting a DC clean signal or a current coming into the unit. So you don't have to worry about electrosmog on any of these, really, that are the low intensity. Again, except for the ones that are not uh, using a, a filter to convert AC to DC, or, or I'm sorry, a rectifier. Um, so another th last thing I want to point out is that you want to avoid buying, like off of eBay, um, I would just be careful uh, buying used PMF equipment. Uh, you want to make sure you have some kind of guarantee that it's going to arrive and it's going to work as it says it is. And you also have to watch out for people on eBay that do a lot of bait and switch. And again, I won't name names, but there's some very misleading marketers that have these bogus review sites that do bait and switch type of antics where they, they look like they sell all the different products when they try to sell you a QRS, for example. And which also just, it's worth mentioning to beware of any review site on the whole PMF community because what you're going to find is that the, the number one rated product is, is what's being sold. So I think people are kind of seeing through these phony review sites. Now, if it's a review site that's got good information, fine, but I haven't found that many that really provide a good buyer's guide that's, that, that's not all skewed towards selling their brand. So just to conclude, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please do leave some comments. I'm going to answer all the comments. And... Do like this video, subscribe to my channel. I have many more coming. In the next video, we're going to go through countership PMF. We're going to go through these different um, Chinese Alibaba brands just because they're flooding the market right now and people are getting misled. So uh, that's coming next. And thanks again and have a wonderful rest of your day.